we are live sir okay thank you uh, good evening good evening to all uh, first of all let me take this opportunity uh, to welcome you all uh, in this interactive session uh, today we have a distinguished speaker with us uh, and uh, 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 we have separately sent the attendee list so you won't be able to access this attendees on this panel so uh, kavan can you uh, so uh, today we have a distinguished speaker and moderator with us dr minish jain sir i just wanted a brief introduction uh, about minish jain sir sir is a consultant medical oncologist at ruby hall clinic km hospital pune hospital jahangir hospital and nobel hospital pune sir is having very rich research experience he has been investigated for many phase 1 phase 2 phase 3 national and international clinical trials published more than 15 papers and articles in national and international journal sir is lecturer of many national conferences and mini jain sir have received many awards and recognitions for his excellent contribution contribution in oncology disease so i welcome dr mini jain sir for this meeting thank you can you go ahead uh today we have uh, another uh, faculty and panelist dr mithun shah sir mithun shah sir is a consultant medical oncologist at sidus cancer center sir has done dm medical oncology from gujarat cancer research institute uh, dr mithun shah sir worked as a clinical coordinator in various clinical trials and sir has published more than 6 papers in different national and international journals so i welcome dr mithun shah sir uh, in this interactive session thank you thank you and we have a third faculty uh, the distinguished speaker dr sushil mandaniya sir sushil mandaniya sir is a md dm medical oncologist at mandari cancer hospital at nagpur sir has completed his dm from aims delhi worked at tata memorial center mumbai sir is member of various organizations like asco esmo and indian society of medical oncology and sir has participated in many paper presentations clinical research and various publications so i also welcome dr sushil mandaniya sir for this interactive session and uh, let me hand over this session to dr mini jain sir sir please go ahead thank you thank you uh, can we have our slide deck uh, am i going to present it from here or is it going to be presented at your end hello sir uh, hello. hi hello. hi uh see uh, basically we are going to discuss the alk rearrangement in non small cell lung cancer uh, is anybody going to present the slide from uh, that side or i have to share it from my end uh, sir, sir you share it at your end uh, himal yes sir aap share kar rahe ho uh, sir actually just second sir okay alk as we know is an anaplastic lymphoma kind of संदीप को भेजना डिसरेगुलेशन विच इज सीन इन दिस रिसेप्टर टाइरोसिन काइनेस विच लीड्स टू इन एप्रोप्रिएट सिग्नलिंग थ्रू अल्क डोमेन द मोस्ट कॉमन फ्यूजन पार्टनर इज द ई एम एल फोर विच हैपन्स विद दिस and there are variety of other fusion partners which have been identified and the presence of this alk rearrangement is responsive to um, oral alk tki so this is the basis of our discussion today uh, till the time we get our slides and just building up the context so because lung cancer we all know is a disease which is almost one fifth of all the deaths are happening because of lung cancer one tenth of the cancer load is because of lung cancer and lung cancer we know that is not a one disease like it is a multiple disease and we are all going from histopathology to molecular and we are targeting them and alk being the second most common molecular target available to us after egfr because there is a significant uh improvement in survival if you use this alk tki properly there is a great possibility of these people living a normal life so what is important is to understand this molecular things so we will go one step at a time like how to diagnose 
when to diagnose, what are the tests for CNS uh, disease, how do you choose a drug, what do you do, what is your treatment strategy, what is lorlatinib, and where are we having it, what is crown trial, and what are the clinical managements because the drug is considered to be significantly toxic. And that is where the problem is with lorlatinib right now, that people feel it, it's very toxic and they're not able to use it. So uh, we are going to uh, discuss all these aspects. We also know that the incidence of lung cancer in India is increasing. Can we have somebody to share the slide? I was not told that, you know, I'm going to share it. So. Slides Mala share Karun Pajoda. Mala might not open share Karnal. A Tetula Patola the meal. Okay. So, uh, as we know that lung cancer incidence in 2020 is around 72,000 cases and it is going to go up to 120,000 cases in 2040. So the incidence is on rise and mortality. Hello, sir. Need help? Yeah. Oh, one sec. I'm just trying to share the slides. So just click on the share screen button below. Yeah, share screen. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Now you are select. Nah. Yes, it's coming. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Make it full screen, sir. Yeah, one sec. Is it visible now? No, okay. sir, not yet. No? It's yes. not in full screen mode. Able to see this? Slides yes. are visible? Slides are visible, sir, but it's not in full screen mode. So you can click uh, one, two, three slides uh, when you change the slides, sir. So it will do. It will do. This is okay? Yes, sir. You can move ahead. Can you see the slides now? Yes, sir. We can see the slides. Okay. But, uh, okay. So the mortality. Can... Uh, go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Okay. The mortality uh, is also significant. Almost uh, 66,000 people out of 72 will die. Uh, so 26% uh, five year survival for all NSCLC and 8% for a metastatic NSCLC. That is what is the thing. So Mithun, I would like to ask you, what is the incidence of bulk mutated NSCLC in your clinical practice? Uh, we see around uh, 5 to 7 percent uh, is the regular incidence we see, sir. Okay. Because, uh, yeah, that is what we also see almost 4 or 5 percent is our uh, thing. But uh, sometimes what I've recently noticed is that if a patient is like a non-smoker, and is like otherwise a young person, not heavily smoker, or if they are any of those categories, and if they have not responded to immunotherapy protocol, despite some of my patients who came um, foundation one negative and NGS negative, subsequent testing came all positive. Yes. So I've started doing actually sequential testing for all these highly uh, suspected category. I'm doing tissue biopsy as well as liquid biopsies. I don't know. Uh, Sushil, do you also believe in this kind of strategy? Regarding the testing? Uh, testing. Okay. Are you doing okay. tissue sequential or what is your plasma first? What is your... Uh, now, when we talk about uh, clinical practice, we are in the clinical practice. Generally, most of the time we end up getting tissue biopsies and getting the art testing on this. Very rarely we do go for NGS if there is no conclusion reports available or the tissue is not available. In that circumstances, generally we go for uh, NGS. Uh, yeah. I am saying that tissue 
and liquid are you doing both together in no, 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 suspected no, no. cases see there was a study no. nile study where they studied that almost if you have uh, this kind of thing uh, in patients who are metastatic 282 patients were seen and 48% increase in finding a mutation which is quite significant so in some patients who are affording and if they are able to do it i am suggesting them both the things to be done together so they are complementing each other and you are able to detect more better mutations compared to only tissue testing okay. so this is something one can look at uh, this is the alk mutation so this is the lmc lcmc means the lung cancer mutation consortium is saying that alk is seen in 7.9 so in some studies it has been even reported up to 11.7%. Yeah. But in our practice, we are seeing it less, approximately 5% of patients, adenocarcinomas, non-smokers or light former smokers, younger patients, and EML4 ALK and EGFR mutations are mutually exclusive. But we had seen one or two patients where both the mutations were seen. So yeah, it's not true. that they are absolutely never seen i have seen two patients where both the mutations were there and we treated actually that patient with both the mutation targets so mutin have you seen such combinations together yes yes sir we have also seen one or two patients and uh, uh, both the combinations were there EG, egfr and alk and uh, the treatment was given Sequentially, I think I reviewed the literature. So they started to start with EGFR based treatment or ALK based. There were mixed reports, but you can start sequentially, was what I have a treat. Yeah. So uh, at your end, social, you have any addition have, to this? Like, you know, have you seen such combinations? I had seen one combination, and uh, then we reviewed again. We discussed with the pathologist uh, where we ascended it. And fortunately, it was. Uh, only EGFR positive ALK was negative at the second time. Oh, so okay. uh, this I had discussed in our oncological forum also, and this they they, they told me to do this. And when I did this, uh, fortunately, it came out to be negative, and the EGFR was positive. Okay. So, yeah. so EML four ALK fusion was initially reported in two thousand seven, and basically a small number of NACLC like five percent we see have an inversion of chromosome two, which is the cause of fusion of ALK gene. Yeah, on, bhai, mere dono doctor join kiye hain, par mere ko dikh nahi raha attendee mein. Slides are not moving, sir. Ab no? No, uh, no, sir. Now they are still. This slide? So it's not in full screen, sir. No, but we are seeing only the sides, small slides. Yes, sir. Yes, I am also seeing that only. Uh, you are not seeing the slides. We so just uh, click on uh, op slide show option on top, on top of top of your screen, sir. Besides slide. animation, uh, a slideshow option on top of your screen, sir. More, and there is no option coming beyond this. That slideshow, uh, slideshow, sir. Ah, sir, so you uh, can also uh, click on the. the we can see the full screen here. Uh, in so our, can you uh, stop share and share it again? New share, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. It might be stuck. Hmm. Uh, Actually, we are not getting that option, you know, to edit uh, full screen or slide. Uh, in our computer, it is showing complete full screen. So uh, just can you take the uh, command and do it at your end? One second, I'll stop the screen sharing and then you okay. can share it again. Now share it again, sir. Your screen. Awesome. Now it is coming. Sir, here. And now make it full screen, sir. Is it okay now? One second, it's happening, sir. Resume slideshow. 
just click on resume slide show Now it is okay, na? Move the slide and check. Move the slides. Can you see that? No, sir. Move, move to set. It's not. Moving. It is moving here. <laughs> it's moving on your side. Here it is not moving, sir. Yes, sir. It's not moving here. Can you share at your end? Um, the share it uh, on my email ID, sir. I I can share it from my end. Huh? You have the slides. No sir, I don't have the slides. Come on, sir. Can you yeah. share me share me the slides, sir? Should I share the? Hello, uh, uh, Prashant, sir. To so, Sandeep Kapoor and also. I'll. Hello. Uh, give no, me your email ID, sir. Yes, sir. Zainab, can you give me give your email ID, sir? Zainab. Yeah, wait. Yeah. Yeah. Give me your email ID. I'll share it. Okay. Ah, oh, but it's okay. What are you? Stop share. Can you do it? We tried, sir. I think there is some laptop issue. I guess. Actually, in our laptop, uh, in our system, we are uh, seeing that full screen showing. Uh, we can check it again. Now. So now resume slide show once again. Now it is coming, right? No, sir, not yet. Okay, you update. We will wait for uh, thirty seconds. You update us. Can you able to see now? Here it is coming perfect. Yes. We can't see. We can't see. No. Uh, sir, I have shared email with you. You may send this on this email. Can you ask Jay to send me? Uh, just send me on WhatsApp your email ID. Yeah. Okay. H J I C A I N I N A V you can uh, WhatsApp the slides on the JSON number. At the gmail dot com. Twenty two gmail dot com. Yeah. I've sent. Please check. Okay, so we'll take some questions. Meanwhile, uh, what is the preferred? Testing platform at your center, Mithun, for ALK and SCLC. Now we there is little bit change what we are doing. We are trying to do get the NGS done uh, at baseline. So uh, initially our pattern was to do IHC, IHC, and if it is inconclusive, then fish report. But now since we are moving towards NGS. We try to do the NGS at baseline uh, for the lung cancer patients. Okay. The sensitivity, sensitivity of NGS is slightly better than the IHC or fish. I think so. Okay, Sushil, what is your preference? NGS, PCR, fish, IHC, DNA sequencing, RNA sequencing. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, the preference will be NGS followed by fish followed by IHC. But the preference is in our mind. But the most of the time we end up getting the free coupons for this. So <laughs> that that is the issue. But yeah, the yeah. ultimately, if, if, if yeah, if possible, I as you had already told, NGS tissue biopsy, the liquid biopsy along with the frozen this uh, tissue biopsy. But generally, it is not possible. We, when we talk about practically, if academically, yes, it, it should be done. But practically, it's not possible because most of the time we see in our practice, patients generally don't do it unless and until we get a free coupons for them. But given the option, I will do both and preferably NGS first followed by tissue. Agreed. Agreed. NGS. Uh, see, if you are looking at fusion, ideally, you should be doing an RNA sequencing that is complementing best to a DNA NGS. So fusions are seen best with RNA. DNA based NGS is the commonest thing what we are doing, but fusions yes. can be missed. Okay. So if you are looking at this, that's the reason I said, if you are looking at sensitive drugs, sensitive test, you should be really sensitive. The doctor should be sensitive. 
So what about the what is the percentage of the things which are missed on this thing and which are uh, picked on the fusion? Ah, uh, if you are doing repeated, I have lot of cases where they were based on the previous things negative. NGS was negative, uh, foundation one negative, and subsequently you re biopsy and it comes positive, and then the life of that person changes. So. Uh, in some patients, I had to do four biopsies before I got a ALK positive or a ROS positive, and uh, things have just changed for them. So, if you don't give up, if you are suspecting that there is a possibility of a target, don't give up. Maybe you are just spending another ten thousand, fifteen thousand. That's okay. But for that person, it is a huge difference which is happening if you do this. So, my suggestion that never give up if you. If your immunotherapy is not working, if your chemo is not working, the patient is progressing. You feel that the patient was otherwise having some mutation. Try it again, and I can give you a lot of examples like this. And I have many cases where they get absolutely clean uh, subsequently. So, in fact, one of the cases of lorlatinib in my uh, lorlatinib study was a person who had everything negative. And he had undergone four types of chemotherapy. Young person, paraplegic. On the fourth biopsy, we got him ALK positive. Then after that, he survived crizotinib, seritinib, lorlatinib, and seven years of survival now. On uh, after four lines of failure in a paraplegic setting. So you see this type of uh, thing in the EJPR positive patient, multiple treatment, progressing, then doing biopsy and getting ALK positive. Yeah, we have. One patient coming all positive after EGFR, but this is known. See, basically, you are not looking at tumor heterogeneity. So, when you are doing only biopsy, you are looking at only one particular class. Mm. When you are looking at liquid biopsy, you are looking at a tumor heterogeneity. So, if you are going to be see in future, it's going to happen that your ALK will not be treated on basis of only ALK positivity. You may be treating them based on what is the mutation there. So, you may be choosing your. Excuse me, sir. Based, yeah. Yeah, sorry for disturbing, but uh, I have uh, uh, I've got the slides. I'll share it with you, and yeah, you'll have share. the control of it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, please. So, uh, in future, this is going to happen that you know you will be not treating them based on only um, the ALK positivity. You may be looking at whether you want to use your second generation, third generation based on what is the mutation available on to you, and whether you want to. Is it visible? Those... Yeah. Uh, Go yeah, on. Eleventh yeah, slide. Yeah. Slide number eleven. Okay, so there is a significant unmet need for ALK positive non-small cell lung cancer. Um, basically, the CNS metastasis, which is in twenty to forty percent of patients, and the ALK resistance mutations. Uh, which are there in this kind of class? So my question to you, Mithun, that would you be doing an imaging for all your ARC positive patients, or where are you going to do? Which are the patients you will recommend, and what are the methods you are using for your evaluation of CNS meds? Uh, basically, if uh, uh, metastatic uh, breast, uh, metastatic lung cancer, and especially ARC positive, I will do a baseline MRI. For sure, sir, because okay. of high incidence of brain meds. Um, basically, okay. MRI. Okay. Social. Contrast, any change? MRI. CT brain or MR? MR, MR, no doubt. MR with contrast. MR with contrast. MR yeah. with contrast. That is for sure. Yeah. Because next one, slide. CT scan will never pick up the leptomeningeal deposits, and the most of the time, uh, uh, the soft tissue lesions which are there on the MR are better picked as compared to CT scan. Agree. Uh, yeah, NCCN does mention, like NCCN and ISMO mention MRI with contrast, but they also say that CT brain with an iodinated contrast is okay. Means you can, but I also prefer that if person cannot uh, get us MR done, you do at least a CT. But what is happening is most of our patients are doing PET CT anyway. Yeah. So the only point remains is now MR for these patients. In USA, they are doing CT only. So they're not doing PET CT. We are seeing almost everybody is now doing PET CT. Next slide. Next. So you can, can we... control it from your side. Achha, I can control it. Yes, yes. Oh, it's not moving. 
So I'll just click on screen and then send push the back request. Arrow button. Yes. No. Yes, sir. It's it's moving, sir. It's moving, sir. Yeah. Okay. Now it's moving. Okay. Right. So uh, if you look at NCCN, cranial MRI, and ISMO also recommends MRI. But yes, all patients who are more than stage one should undergo an um, MRI for the brain. That is for sure. And MRI has an advantage over CT because it's more sensitive, as we rightly said. And it should be like contrast is preferable in this kind of thing. But CT is faster. MRI is the best. Next is okay. So, uh, uh, Sushil, how do you manage this CNS metastasis in L positive cases? What is your treatment strategy for them? Unmute. Unmute yourself, Sushil. So you are on mute. Yeah, sorry, sorry. I'm really sorry. So it all depends upon whether it is an afferent uh, CNS metastasis or whether it is metastasis which has developed after the continuation of the treatment. So on afferent, when it is possible, generally if it is ALK positive, we had seen generally when we start with the laudatory, nearly 70% of the patient will respond and uh, there will be complete responses. So in this condition, we can save them from the whole brain RT. And if there is a progression, if there is a headache, if, there, if they don't respond or there is a medical emergency in the form of uh, raise intracranial tension where we need urgent intervention then only there is a role of any intervention in the form of RT otherwise generally they respond very well to this uh, lorlatinib okay, on the baseline afferent disease do you start lorlatinib to each patient given the option yes sir because uh, we last one year and a half years we are we are trying to do that and in cns metastasis if, if option is given yes definitely okay mithun do you uh, agree uh, basically, uh, uh, brain meds can be asymptomatic and symptomatic. Mm -hmm. Asymptomatic meds, I agree with Sushil that uh, we need not give any uh, CNS directed treatment like radiotherapy or uh, surgery. Uh, but uh, in asymptomatic meds, upfront lorlatinib first line, I have not used much. I can, uh, if the given a choice, I can go for a second generation. Uh, TK second generation like seritinib or something and keep lorlatinib uh, in future. But uh, that is a patient, individual patient based judgment. Uh, otherwise, I think I agree with uh, Shushi. Okay. Now the patient is on uh, seritinib and has a progression with CNS disease. What would you do? Then uh, I have an option of lorlatinib. Uh, this is, uh, but would you start only lorlatinib or would you go for an Whole brain RT or an SRS or a surgery? Uh, sir, if the if still my option will be like, uh, if it is in small progression, asymptomatic, I will still uh, avoid radiation and go for uh, this kind of, uh, because with such good intracranial efficacy, I expect uh, the patients to do well. Okay. So basically, uh, yes, if there is asymptomatic progression, you can just use a drug which has better penetration into the brain and that should take care of the disease. And if it is not, then you can add radiation along with uh, whether it can be a whole brain or a SRS depending upon the patient's condition. Okay. So in summary, we have ALK positivity seeing 20 to 30% of patients will have brain metastasis. You should do an MRI. You should choose a drug which has got a better penetration into the brain. And you should also look at a drug which has a less possibility of uh, uh, mutations happening while on the drug. So if you are trying to do this, then lorlatinib definitely would be a good drug here. Liquid biopsy, as I said, is a choice. If you are able to do it along with your tissue, if you want to look at the CSF, uh, means CNS metastasis, you will have to do CSF analysis, which is not possible in our cases. If you are looking at molecular profiling 
and you're going to choose a drug, then that is possibly a future that looking at the mutations and then deciding whether you want to go for a second generation or third generation, because a lot of mutations which are happening on second generation can be taken care by lorlatinib. And so this is again the same thing, trying to understand patient characteristics and biological features. If you want to do this, then you need to really undergo liquid biopsies and look at the heterogeneity. And then you choose one of the drugs which will be giving you the best progression-free survival, best overall survival, CNS activity, and that kind of thing. So this is what should be your plan. So let's look at lorlatinib, which is the drug of our interest today. And what is this? This is a third generation ALK TKI, which is having an excellent brain penetration, which is uh, uh, having, like in the study, it had only one patient who had failed in the entire cohort in CNS. So this is how the activity of this drug is. And there is a definitely a delay in target resistance and there is a more durable, more durable clinical benefit which is seen if you use this drug upfront. So how do you sequence your drugs, uh, uh, Sushil? If you are looking at ALK and you don't have a CNS metastasis, patient is ALK positive. And they are generally young patients. So how do you sequence your uh, treatment? Like whether you go for second line, uh, second generation and lorlatinib or lorlatinib upfront? You said in last one year you are using lorlatinib. Sir, you are on mute. This is for my, me. Dr. Jain, this, this question is yeah, directed yeah. to me. Yeah. So the question here was, ki, what is the sequence we are doing? Sir, uh, considering the data, the, the weapons we are having right now, the third generation, second generation, first generation, you can see whenever we are using a least, less potent weapon, we are generating a more uh, uh, resistant clones and mutant clones. And when we you see the data about the lorlatinib, you can see it is very effective in preventing the generation of the resistant clone. At the same time, it is very effective in treating those resistant clone. At the same time, it has got a very good CNS penetration. And the fourthly, it has uh, it is it is it is known to prevent the uh, disease going into the brain. So, given the option, and the, and you can see the DFS of the the, the lorlatinib. So, everything favors them. If we should start with the best available drug possible, that is low lorlatinib. So, if given the option, I will definitely will be starting all my health patients with the low lorlatinib, considering all these uh, things into the happening. But uh, having said this, practically it is not possible. Okay. Cost is when uh, we... cost is prohibitive. I yeah. also would suggest that you know, if you have a better uh, program, PAP program, lorlatinib would be a drug of choice for most of the. Uh, okay. doctors out of future. 10 patients only one can do this which i had seen uh, yeah mithun what is your uh, I, say on this i agree sir the cost is prohibitive in indian setup and uh, but the data is really encouraging like 36 years the pf 36 months the pfs has not reached so i think uh, it is the preferred option uh, but let's see like if we can if, keep this, uh, we can have the basic resistance mechanism and all study it at baseline, we may see some different approach. Otherwise, I agree with you. Okay. And also, we know that the toxicity of this drug is a little different. It mm -hmm. has got some neurologic and lipid uh, mm -hmm. toxicities compared to electinib, which is myalgias and brigatinib, which is pulmonary event. So, the drugs are different. They are, though they are all health positive, they have little different toxicity profiles which require to be controlled. Uh, but this definitely... CNS toxicity is generally, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but this CNS toxicity, what as per the literature, is more in those patients who had already had CNS metastasis. Yeah. As compared so, to those patients who have 71% no of these patients yeah. were having CNS metastasis. And uh, when we look at the, the face to face data about comparison of adverse effect with the quizotinib, you can see the there was 9% versus 7% of dropouts. So that means that though the toxicities were there, they were not uh, uh, the withdrawal of the drugs. So that means they were quite manageable, at least in the clinic and the trial setup. Yeah, I agree that you know this was uh, already if you have CNS toxicity, uh, CNS disease, and 
then you have been irradiated. So there is always something which is going to be affecting either the drug or the disease. And you can really the, separate the it the, What I feel the more the drug has got broadband barrier crossing capability, more definitely it is going to have some type of CNS toxic as compared to other drugs. That is also true. So uh, that should not put us down. We are definitely, uh, and even the lipid profile thing, we were initially scared while we were using lorlatinib, but uh, now we are quite comfortable with statins being used upfront uh, in this kind of patient. So that is something we are doing routinely. So we keep our physicians involved right on day one uh, okay. with this kind of drug. So this is a crown trial where uh, the patients were randomized as one as to one lorlatinib versus crizotinib. And the interesting points here were like the primary endpoint that is progression-free survival and uh, the intracranial overall response and intracranial time to progression. These were something very important. There was no crossover in this study. Um, almost 147 and 149 patients uh, were being looked at and the characteristics were well balanced. So if you look at the study, if you look at the baseline, uh, age, sex, race, ECOG, smoking, current stage of disease, histological types, previous anti-cancer treatments, brain meds, prior radiotherapy. So they were quite well balanced uh, on both the things. And 18 months follow up on this kind of patients. Um, the data is also quite interesting. The progression-free survival by BICR, that is the branded independent central review, and lorlatinib significantly pro uh, prolonged the progression-free survival compared to crizotinib and hazard ratio uh, of progression or death of 0.28. Very, very significant. Even if you look at the investigator based is also very significant. Now 0.21. So this is something what we want in patients who are otherwise going to do well. They need to be controlled in their CNS also. So this is where this drug has definitely an age and crown trial is one of the things which tells us that significantly more patients on lorlatinib had objective response compared to crizotinib. Uh, the intracranial overall response rate, lorlatinib significantly higher intracranial response rate compared to crizotinib. So you see almost a significant difference in this response, whether there are brain meds to begin with or there are no brain meds to begin with. And the time to failure out of their CNS events or non-CNS events in both lorlatinib was significantly better compared to crizotinib. So in all these points, whether it is CNS progression, whether it is outside CNS progression, all those things and overall survival, there was no uh, 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 difference because this has been this were not evaluable. So at the time of data cutoff, the OS data is still evolving, and the, there was no difference, significant difference between them because this is still evolving. So this is right now not evaluable. So OS is not evaluable in this particular thing, but safety wise, the drug is quite safe. If you look at there was some more grade three, grade four toxicities in numerically, but uh, temporary dose reduction or total dose reduction or stoppage of drug was not significant. So overall safety profile of lorlatinib was quite okay. So uh, Mithun, what are the toxicities you are looking at when you are looking at lorlatinib? So are you concerned with these toxicities of uh, lorlatinib, which is like hypercholesterolemia or triglyceridemia or edema, what are the things which are I think more worrisome for you? Hypercholesterolemia is really an, not worrisome, but we should keep a watch because they may have uh, very high and they are all young patients. So if <coughs> cholesterol goes above 500 or if it is grade 3, grade 4, 400 to 500 and above, then we have to really increase the dose of statin. Uh, other other side effects, I think, uh, it can be monitored like edema is there, some mood changes are there, but they are all mild. What more important is the hypercholesterolemia, I feel. 
Okay. So, Shil, how do you manage these things? Like if uh, triglycerides are going up or cholesterol are going up, what do you tell your patient or what do you do? The first important thing is that baseline uh, values. Second thing is that we need to counsel them that this is going to happen. And for this, we need to be very cautious. Third thing is that diet counseling is very important because anyhow, this, is what this, this drug is doing one thing and their diet can aggravate that. So third is this. And fourthly, they should be under the a good physician care also, because as you are already told, because they are, they are this type of drugs, we are not used to handling such things. So those, those monitoring, then decreasing the dose and the regular follow-up. And first two, three months are very important because these are the time where we can see a lot of fluctuations. And once the things are stabilized generally, then they, they, they do well. So this is about the hyper uh, triglyceridemia and I had seen the, if the triglyceride increases on a very high level, I had seen one pa patient uh, having stroke, one, one thing, uh, TI side of events, which can be attributed to either triglyceridemia or it can be because of the CNS toxicity because of the drug itself. And the second is pancreatitis. So the, we need to be very cautious because <clears throat> this can be confused by, by the, uh, the bone mates. It can be confused. And the third thing is the liver toxicities because any, any liver disease, liver toxicity and abdominal pain, which this can mimic as if it is something which is a solid organ disease, but it can be a small pancreatitis which, which may go uh, lethal if it is untreated. So that, that thing is there is a lot of chain of events into this. And if we can manage at the baseline and if, we, if the physician knows what is going to happen and we can train our patient that way, I think it is to do manageable. So that is for hypertrialis anyway. Uh, how do you see that, you know, using a stronger drug, would it improve the quality of life or deteriorate the quality of life or what do you see? What about the uh, stronger means? Like lorlatinib, generation 3 drugs or second generation drug or crizotinib. So should we start considering like, you know, first generation, milder drug, less toxic or? We, we are most of the time when we are dealing with the lung malignancy, we are generally are, we are dealing with advanced of metastatic disease. So the, 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 the oxygen is very less. That means the margin is very less for us. So when we are using a less potent drug and if it is progressing, the general condition deteriorates and the performance status goes down. And it, 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 unfortunately, if it is present with the brain metastasis on the progression, again, the things worsen. So my take will be to go for the best possible drug that decreases the pro risk of progression, increases the quality of life. At the same time, when we are seeing the major problem we see is disease progression, uh, development of resistant clone, and third is brain metastasis. So if a single drug can take care of this all, so theoretically that we should use our best weapon first. Okay, lorlatinib actually in a Hello? study showed that it improved oh. the quality of life. So, uh, so patients in lorlatinib group had significantly greater improvement from baseline in global quality of life than those who received crizotinib. So, this is a wrong concept that you know if you are using a milder drug, it will cause the quality of life improves when you control the disease and not from the toxicity of a drug. So, this is what we must remember. And the data from 36 months of this follow-up is also very significant. At 36 months, the lorlatinib showed that the PFS still remained significantly longer than crizotinib, almost similar. The hazard ratio is 0.27. So that is something very, very significant. You look at all the things, whether you're looking at the progression with or without brain metastasis, a similar kind of graph almost going. Uh, intracranial time to progression, almost similar. Every consistent reports at month 18 and month 36, an overall summary between lorlatinib and crizotinib, if you look at, uh, then it is consistent. What we see at 18 months, we see at 36 months. Almost similar for whether it is brain metastasis, without brain metastasis, and if there is a measurable brain metastasis, the responses were more superior. In a lorlatinib, then those who were treated, like if you had a brain which was measurable, then there was a significant difference happening in this kind of patients in their subsequent thing. So if you look at the key takeaway from, and the toxicities were also not, the temporary discontinuations were there, but permanent discontinuation in lorlatinib arm were less compared to crizotinib arm. 
So, if you look at 18 months and 36 months, the progression free survival, overall survival, intracranial time to progression, uh, intracranial complete response in brain metastasis, all those things are almost matching what you see in 18 months and 36 months. So, the key takeaway from crown trial with approximately 18 months of additional follow-up since interim analysis, lorlatinib continues to show superior overall and intracranial efficacy. The progression-free survival remains longer with lorlatinib. The three-year uh, rate is 63.5% for lorlatinib versus 18.9 with quizotinib. The time to intracranial progression is significantly longer in lorlatinib. No safety signals were, no new safety signals were observed. The long-term updated crown trial data confirms efficacy of lorlatinib or frisotinib and the efficacy benefits of lorlatinib in observed not only in patients with baseline brain metastasis, but in also in patients without brain metastasis, only one in 112 patients actually had a progression in brain mets uh, from no brain mets. So this is uh, showing the efficacy of this drug into the brain. Okay, so looking at this data now, Mithun, what is your say on crown trial and what do you agree to this data? Yes, sir. Do you I think, think this is impressive? This is impressive because they have done a comparator with chrysotinib and the data is really impressive and it should be, uh, a, a, it has already come in NCC and then I agree that it should be one of the first line drugs to be used. In metastatic setting. With okay, or without so brain, your say on this? Uh, so, yes, this has come in NCCN, and you have this uh, possibility of either yeah, lorlatinib yeah. or alectinib um, as a first line. And that is where you can see all these three drugs can be used. Brigatinib is not available, alectinib versus this. But uh, uh, now, my question to you, Sushil, would you say that alectinib and lorlatinib and alectinib, if it is, why not alectinib, why lorlatinib? Let's look at this now. Sir, when we when we see about alectinib and lorlatinib, we don't have any face-to-face -face, uh, comparison between these two drugs, first thing. Second thing is ki when we talk about uh, lorlatinib, it has got a better CNS penetration as compared to alectinib. And you can see the, the PFS advantage of uh, lorlatinib is slightly better than alectinib. So I think this, this again uh, goes in favor of uh, lorlatinib. But having said this, I don't have any first hand experience with alectinib. Okay. Mithun? I think alectinib will uh, be a second generation TKI hmm. and few mutations uh, which, uh, uh, which are more covered with lorlatinib. Like G128 and all, I don't remember the exact names, but 1202. Uh, 1202 is more better covered with uh, lorlatinib. So uh, maybe lorlatinib scores over electinib in that front. But yeah, others, yes. others will depend, others defend like you start with electinib and keep lorlatinib in future. That is what the oh. sense. So lorlatinib in first line oh. treatment with yeah. all positive non small cell. A network meta analysis, and this is uh, with this was presented in 2021. And if you look at lorlatinib, reduced the hazards to progression compared to other treatments in meta analysis. So it was comparing between ansartinib, uh, brigatinib, alectinib, alectinib at both the doses, seritinib at three doses, crizotinib. So all these things, lorlatinib is the effective first-line treatment in ALK positive when compared to crizotinib or any next generation. And uh, if you look at the effectivity of lorlatinib compared to all other treatments, so it favors lorlatinib. Any, any, anything you see lorlatinib? Uh, one thing I had uh, seen with the comparison between the alectinib and uh, this uh, brigatinib was lorlatinib scores less in Asian smokers which I don't think there is any any data for the lorlatinib here. So, 
I don't know whether whether uh, loaded risk score better in those patients uh, like Asian and smokers. We can see the the forest graph uh, be comparing between this uh, electinib and uh, brigatinib. You see, in smokers and Asians, it didn't it didn't uh, fare better. Uh, it's lesser as compared to the next next slide. I think. Okay. No, I, I I'm not aware of but this, but definitely we will look into this aspect. Uh, but I had no personal experience. Uh, it was in the we data have data used lorlatinib in four or five patients, but most of the patients were heavily treated. So first line, I had no not much of experience. Uh, I have used lorlatinib always as second line or third line. But definitely, I would love to use a drug which has got such a good efficacy. The my only initial concern was the cholesterol and triglyceride, but those can be managed and we know that they are not, they're, they're just numbers which are to be handled. So comparison between lorlatinib, alpinib and brigatinib in untreated patients. So this was a systemic review and uh, uh, network meta-analysis. And um, uh, say, okay, this is moving too fast. Okay, so lorlatinib was significantly uh, shows a significant PFS advantage over brigatinib and alectinib with a probability to reach the best PFS of 97.5% in previously untreated patients with ALK positive and advanced non-small cell. So this is what uh, was just told that the PFS is the best for this drug. And if you look at the subgroup analysis, uh, most of the subgroup analysis except smokers. This is where I think uh, you said that it favors electinib, right? Smokers and Asian. Okay, so I was not aware about this, but uh, yes, this is where we can think about if it is a heavy smoker, electinib favors uh, over lorlatinib. So this is where the thing is. But if you look at ranking in terms of which is the best drug, rank one is lorlatinib, rank two is alectinib, rank three is brigatinib, rank four is crizotinib. This is without CNS meds and with CNS meds, both places lorlatinib is number one. So ranking wise in progression free survival. So conclusion from network meta-analysis, lorlatinib significantly improves PFS compared to brigatinib, alectinib. There is no significant difference in uh, found in OS because OS is almost comparable in all the arms. There is not much of uh, these patients are surviving quite long on most of these things. So OS is not uh, different. But if you are looking at uh, uh, lorlatinib, alectinib, brigatinib, prisotinib, lorlatinib had a highest probability to reach the best overall confirmed response rate with 48% and intracranial confirmed response rate of 44%. So this is where lorlatinib scores. And in terms of progression-free survival, the results of lorlatinib were best uh, in untreated ALK positive advanced non-small cell lung cancer who were ALK inhibitor 9. What happens is if you are using lorlatinib subsequently, the chances of metas are uh, Resistant clones are higher, which will reduce down the PFS of the drug. So uh, let's look at the toxicity profile. Uh, we did discuss this uh, lipid lowering agents, uh, cholesterol, uh, triglycerides needs to be monitored at baseline first month and second month after initiation, you need to explain your patients right on day one that this is what is going to happen. And you can use these statins which do not interact with lorlatinib. So uh, you may use fibrates, fish oil, you may give uh, diet uh, advice to your patients and you may monitor them. But when do you stop the drug? Uh, Mithun, how do you stop the drug or where do you stop or where do you lower the drug dosaging? Sir, if the hypercholesterolemia is very high, like they have set a cutoff of 500 or more, 
then temporarily we can stop and uh, increase the dose of statins and then again start uh, with the same dose once more so i have in practice i have not stopped any of the drug of lorlatinib uh, because all the side effects were manageable grade 3 at the most i saw it but uh, that is what is what i have uh, seen okay mm. uh social okay so basically if you have any of these toxicities oh sorry you, My, my, it was a mute. Any toxicity which were uncontrollable in the form of hypertriglyceridemia or resistant convulsions, these were the patients in the Crown study where they had stopped the drug and they had reintroduced the drug in the lower lower doses. That was in the seventy five milligram. Okay, so this is uh, this is the guidance. So depending upon your toxicity, if it is a mild moderate, you may just stop the drug and continue the same dose. Uh, once the patient stabilizes on your statins, if it is severe, you may cut down the dose by twenty-five milligram, and if it is life-threatening, you may uh, think of withholding, lowering the dose, or stopping it forever. Whichever way, yeah, depending upon the situations, <coughs> what comes up. But we never had to stop the drug totally. We had to just stop it temporarily and restart. Most of our patients never had to go on a lower dose also. so lorlatinib cns effect as we just discussed 71% patients had uh, cns metastasis out of 24 15 patients had total resolution of their cns effect 40% patients had combined uh, experiences and 12% patient had more than one cns effect so this is what is the uh, presentation of cns if you have cns toxicity then what you do is if it is mild stop the drug and rechallenge with the same dose or you may reduce it down by 25 mg if it is moderate or severe you may again stop the drug and rechallenge with a reduced dose and if it is grade 4 then you may permanently discontinue lorlatinib so the question to my expert do you rebiopsy Every ALK mutated patient at progression, uh, Doctor Mithun. No, sir. We don't do much because the standard uh, because the resistance mechanism were very available in very few labs. So practically and personally, I don't do much. But if I we got a good NGS uh, uh, lab, I may do it. Okay, social. no we don't know what are the mutation mechanisms or what are the resistance pattern you are seeing or what are you looking at what are the type of resistance you are looking at i think it is so there are two kinds of uh, resistance which can happen one is the alk dependent and one is the alk independent so if your patients are not responding you should biopsy because there is always a possibility of them changing their mutations we just discussed that you know they may if you have used a drug where the chance of genetic mutations are least with alk like you are using lorlatinib and the patient progresses it may be an alk independent mutation so that's the reason why you should do it now is there a preference between using a tissue biopsy versus liquid biopsy methun what do you say and social what do you say so then i'll prefer a tissue biopsy sir it, it because it is more it will give more information it is not like t790 mutation where i think i can find uh, in the blood but the only point is sir even after doing a rebiopsy if my choices are not going to change much so sometimes it becomes yeah. very difficult to convince for this no there can be it may be a small cell malignancy yeah. but sir i if it is an adn egfr mutation i can i am more inclined in doing a repeat biopsy alk mutation even if i find a mutation which is going to be sensitive to lorlatinib i will use the same molecule no if you have already used lorlatinib and now there is a progression 
then the chemotherapy is left no sir chemotherapy is left we have not used chemotherapy plus immunotherapy in this that's what i'm saying so would you prefer doing a biopsy would you just go for chemotherapy re biopsy personally i do more in egfr mutated progressive disease in alk mutation progressive i'm little bit not that uh, enthusiastic to do a repeat biopsy okay the problem with alk mutation is if the the progression is cns then we are left with no tissue to biopsy so there the liquid biopsy can help us uh again as i said then you require a csf uh, liquid biopsy yes. because it may not be crossing the blood brain barrier uh, it won't allow the mutations to be moving in blood from yes. cns so you so ideally do that csf uh, liquid biopsy because i had heard and and, uh, and the dread uh, you can you can do a csf a liquid biopsy is what you are looking at circulating cells Secondary you can pick it up from wherever you want you are looking either at a circulating dna or a circulating cell yeah. so you can pick it up from whichever place you want that's not an issue um, yes tissue and liquid biopsy the advantage of tissue biopsy 100% accurate liquid biopsy 70% uh, liquid biopsy it gives you more heterogeneity uh, yeah. so it gives you more idea of the tumor uh, whether sequential or uh, whether to do it simultaneously that is uh, depending upon the finances and your kind of thing i told you that there is a study nile study where 282 patients 48% increase in picking up mutations in future if you are going to use drugs based on the mutations available then yes to choose between lorlatinib and alectinib you may choose lorlatinib in patients who have more alk mutations or stronger mutations 1202 you want to use lorlatinib upfront you may have to tell your patient why not this drug immediately so uh, all these things would matter right now we are not doing it but we will start doing it when we know it so the uh, point here is that we should know it to do it so these are the uh, mutations which are there in crizotinib resistant specimen seritinib alectinib so more stronger drug you use the lesser are the mutations left behind so if you use lorlatinib you will have lesser mutations and this is a mutation which is of concern 1202 and if you look at if you use lorlatinib after multiple line failure the chances of pfs is going to be lower and lower so if you have two prior tki more than two prior tki three tki the pfs is dropping so that is another reason and there are more clones which are coming up in previously treated so there are more resistant clones which are making the tumor more difficult to respond so if you are using lorlatinib upfront that is what you achieve and if you use it in sequence you may do it better only with alectinib and lorlatinib the rest of the time it may not go to that length so you will have to really choose which one you want to use uh which way you want to use so we can take questions from panelist and from everybody sir have you seen any type of resistant diarrhea with the tks resistant diarrhea because uh, i had seen one patient very difficult to treat so i don't know how how to uh, so have you seen such type of diarrhea because here also lorlatinib they had given a diarrhea as one of the side effects so have you come across such such that uh, generally what we do is in such patients we first make sure that they are not on any alternative medicines mm -hmm. because lot of times they are on some ayurvedic or something which they feel innocuous second thing what we try to do is their gut flora we try to replenish that third thing what we do is we reassure the patient that three to four motions are not loose motions fifth thing what i try to do for them is put them on a small dose of steroid vicelon 5 mg uh, daily that is what i try to do and we have seen that most of these patients they stabilize with this simpler things and i would also stop the drug for a week 5 to 7 days and see whether it is stopping of the drug stopping the diarrhea or not so these are few things what i do but i can take your suggestions 
on this. Except for uh, steroid, we have tried everything. <laughs> and we have stopped the drug. We introduced again. She had a severe loose motions, 8 to 12 loose motions daily. And we don't know how to manage. We, we had had all literature, low motile, rosicard rotile, gut flora, everything, but had not tried the steroid. See, so what I'm happens is, it. I'll tell you why steroids. There is an adrenal insufficiency which happens. Mm. So adding a small dose of steroid takes care of that diarrhea. So great. I will try, sir. So I do it with a lot of uh, TKIs. Not only this, I do it with a lot of TKIs. If they are not on clinical trial and they are in my practice, I put them on 5 milligram vice a Good, good idea. Thank you. And this is an important point which we have already discussed. With sequential ALK inhibitors, approximately 35% of patients will develop compound ALK resistance mutation or larlatinib with the solvent form. ALK G1202 resistance are containing compound mutations which will be the most common on target resistant mechanism and in future these are the things which are going to be important when you are doing uh, highly selective ALK mutation testings. So these are something which I wanted uh, to be in our discussion. Agreed. So any questions from anybody we want to discuss on today's topic? Oh, already done. Already. Sorry for getting delayed for 15 minutes, but I was not told that I am going to present the slides. So I was not uh, prepared from my end. No, no, sir. It was very well conducted. We thought we present was so good. <laughs> <laughs> Rukaya, is there any questions on chat box? Yes, Can sir. Uh, yes, sir. I'll check. I'll stop sharing the screen now. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, thank you very much, sir, for taking us through uh, insights of Lorlatinib and Crown Trial. And uh, it was really a great interaction amongst all panelists. So on the behalf of Pfizer Oncology, sir, we would like to give you thanks to Dr. Minish Jain, sir, Dr. Sushil, sir, and Dr. Mithun, sir, for joining on the time and uh, had a great interaction. Before uh, concluding, uh, I just wanted to brief you regarding the uh, patient assistance program for Lorlatinib. So currently, sir, uh, we don't have lifetime support over here, but uh, currently on one plus one, we are uh, providing to the patient. On purchase of one box, patient will receive second box uh, absolutely free. So average cost would be like 1.25 to the patient. See, but you should come up on a fixed pricing. So what happens is we can tell our patients that this is what is your lifetime investment. Absolutely. Okay. So that will help us to get more patients for you. Uh, right. Even Alectinib has come up with that. Yeah. So okay. uh, now yeah. you have lifetime free after 18 months, I think, on Alectinib. Yeah. So, the uh, company will definitely considering uh, seriously on this. Sir. And uh, as any details will be coming, we'll definitely share with you. See, your pricing, according to me, should be somewhere around in a range of 20 to 25 lakhs. If you put that bracket for all your patients, you'll find that a lot of people what happens is today they think that, you know, if I'm getting a drug which is serotinib or chrysotinib or even uh -huh. drugs like, you know, alectinib. So they would prefer that, you know, I would go for that drug. There is a finite cost right. to it. Right. Then we are left with using lorlatinib only at last. Yeah. Where do you find that the drug is anyway used for a few months and then it is stopped? Instead of that, if you improve the handling of this drug with oncologists at large, they will be more comfortable. Right, sir. Agreed, sir. Agreed. And ALK, we see that, as I said, uh, even on my clinical trial, patients are surviving three years plus, which are like heavily treated. So uh, this is the thing what we would suggest. Right, sir. We'll definitely convey your regards, sir. Uh, to upper management 
and we'll get back to you on this sir thank you thank you so thank you thank for you joining us sir thank you vikram thank you yeah. sir thank you sushil bye have a good time sir good night thank you yeah thank you